and welcome to the very first episode of See the Pattern. In today's episode, we are going to examine the lie that redshift is related directly to recessional velocity. And in order to do this, we are going to examine some of the strangest objects in the universe known as quasars. In order to start this story, we have to jump back in time a little. In the 1920s, a huge debate had erupted between two astronomers, Shapley and Curtis, and they were arguing over the size of the universe. Curtis argued that the universe consisted of many galaxies similar to our own, which at the time had been identified as spiral nebula. Shapley, on the other hand, argued that the Milky Way contained everything that we saw in the universe. Edwin Hubble became fascinated by this debate, and he decided he was going to be the one to try and settle it. He figured that if he could measure the distances to the different galaxies, he could prove that either those galaxies existed within our own Milky Way or outside of it, either settling it in Shapley's or Curtis's favour. In order to do this, he had to measure the distances to hundreds of thousands of different galaxies. And in this process, he came up with a classification system to identify the different types of galaxies, which today we know as the tuning fork classification system. Through doing this, he was able to prove that Andromeda, which is our closest galaxy, was further away than the size of the Milky Way galaxy, thereby finally starting to settle the debate. Through doing all of these measurements, Edwin Hubble discovered something rather interesting about the majority of galaxies he observed, and that was that the light seemed to be shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. Each star which emits light will absorb certain frequencies depending on the elements that are contained within the star, creating very distinct black lines, like a fingerprint. So when we observe galaxies, we get like an average for that whole galaxy. And what he observed was that those black lines had become shifted towards the red end of the spectrum for the majority of galaxies he observed. In fact, he noted that it wasn't that they were all shifted by a similar amount, there was a huge variation in the amount that they had been shifted. This implied that the objects were moving away from each other. Some were older and therefore were moving faster. It meant that we were living in a universe that was expanding, and that was one of his great leaps. Now later on in his life, he actually started to question whether that link between the redshift and recessional velocity was as strong as he had thought in the beginning. But by that time, people had already cottoned onto this idea, and very few listened to his objections to the redshift. He started to believe that there was maybe something else that was causing the redshift. Certainly some of it was due to recessional velocity, but something else was tweaking some of those values, meaning you couldn't necessarily say that there was a direct one-to-one -one link between the redshift and recessional velocity. In 1963, Alan Sandage and Thomas Matthews discovered some very unusual objects which had extremely high redshifts. It presented two initial problems for them. The first one with this very high redshift implied that these objects were travelling at enormous speeds away from us. And if they were travelling at these enormous speeds, it implied that they were at the furthest reaches of our known universe to date. The second problem was that even though these objects uh, were supposed to be very, very remote, they were very bright when they observed them, implying that these objects, if you were right next to them, had an almost impossible brightness to them. Halton Arp, who was a protege of Edwin Hubble, became fascinated by these quasars. He observed thousands of these objects and started to build a picture which questioned whether these objects were really as remote as believed. His later work would also question whether these objects were as old as we thought that they would be. In fact, he would go on to demonstrate that potentially quasars were dwarf galaxies being ejected from active galactic nuclei. His ideas contradicted the mainstream view of an expanding universe and the Big Bang. Fellow scientists did not take kindly to this, and he was refused time on his telescopes and publicly humiliated by his colleagues. Eventually, he ended up moving to the Max Planck Institute in Germany to continue his research, sadly passing away in 2013. So let's start to look at some of the evidence that he collected that starts to question whether redshift 
is really just related to recessional velocity. The first example is clustering of quasars. Now there are many examples of quasars being discovered in groups with similar redshifts. One extreme example, which Halton Arp discussed in one of his papers during an analysis of the 2DF deep field image, in this image there are 21 quasars. 14 of these are clustered about a galaxy AM 2230-284. Now, if we assume that redshift does indeed correlate to distance, then this cluster would occupy a distance of 249 megaparsecs. Now, in comparison, the Virgo cluster occupies just 30 megaparsecs. And a quick search of the largest structures in the universe yields more examples of quasar clusters, which are all above the maximum theoretical size possible, given the age of our universe. Number two, quantization of quasars. Through Arp's detailed analysis of so many quasars, he discovered that quasars seem to have redshifts at very specific values. In other words, they are quantized. Initial review of this data will not reveal this quantization, and this is used as one of the reasons scientists debunk Arp's ideas. In order to see the quantization, you need to look at redshift relative to the parent galaxy. We will be going into this in more detail in a, in a future episode, but basically Arp's idea was that the active galactic nuclei spewed out these quasars. And therefore, in order to look at the redshift, you had to look at it relative to the, the galaxy. So if the galaxy is ejecting it, some extra energy goes into these quasars, and therefore, in order to see the quantization, you need to remove the movement of the galaxy itself. So basically, subtract the redshift of the galaxy from the quasar, and this very interesting pattern appears. The redshift of the quasars appears only at very specific values, and not in between. And the sheer volume of quasars that he has analysed should rule out this being any sort of coincidence. Number three, proximity to nearby galaxies and radial alignment. Most quasars appear in pairs and are in close proximity to an active galactic nuclei. More interesting is that these quasars show a pattern whereby they are moving away from the active galactic nuclei. In most pairings, one would be moving in one direction and one in exactly the opposite, i.e. one to the north and then one to the south. And it appears that their angular momentum is conserved conforming with the ejection theory. And there are hundreds of examples in ARP's extensive studies, for example, NGC 3516 and AM 2230-284. And again, below I'll provide some links to some of ARP's papers and other examples uh, that show this, this radial alignment. Number four, physical connection. In Arp's detailed work, he has presented many examples of physical connection between active galactic nuclei and the quasars. Markarian 205 is a good example. In the original image from 1972, a bridge is clearly visible. Many tried to falsify Arp's claim, but in a joint piece with Dr. Jack Salentek from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they performed extensive analysis of the Hubble images and clearly demonstrated that the bridge still exists in the higher resolution images. Lopez and Gutierrez, in their paper on research on non-cosmological redshift, examined many of ARP's examples and in over 50% of the cases found definitive anomalies showing clear connections between these objects and the active galactic nuclei. They even showed different objects with very different redshifts clearly connected via a filamentary bridge. And again, to understand this, if they are physically connected, then it cannot be possible if the quasar has a higher redshift, it cannot be located uh, at the edge of our existing universe. It cannot be that it is that far away because the redshift of the galaxy is much, much lower than the redshift of the quasar and there cannot be a physical connection if our understanding is that redshift implies distance. If, however, the redshift that we see in quasars is not due, or largely not due, to recessional velocity, but something else is going on, then it would help to explain how it is that these structures could be connected. Number five, quasars located in front of galaxies with low redshift. 
Galliani and colleagues presented the case of a strong X-ray source with a relatively high redshift which was situated in front of NGC 7319, an active galaxy with a much lower redshift. And again, it cannot be possible for a quasar with a higher redshift to be situated in front of a galaxy which has a low redshift if we assume that redshift is only to do with recessional velocity. Number 6. Luminosity of quasars. Quasars are objects which are very compact, estimated to occupy a space less than one light year in diameter. If they truly are at these vast distances from us, then their received brightness implies that they must be so energetic that their luminosity is almost unimaginable. Again, from what we have detected, we estimate that for the upper range, that some of these objects are a hundred thousand times more luminous than the Milky Way galaxy, which in turn is 25 million times the luminosity of the Sun. Number seven, redshift surveys of the local galaxies. Now, technically not to do with quasars, but again, it's another nail in the coffin for, for redshift. Okay, for some time, it has been known that the galaxies in our local cluster do not exhibit the same expansion rate compared to galaxies further out. It is believed that this is because they are gravitationally locked together, slowing down the expansion rate. This means we see little redshift in their signatures. And D. Russell used this together with the Tully Fisher ra relationship to identify these galaxies and compare their redshift values. It can be used to calculate our distance to them by measuring the rotation rate and using this to estimate their mass and hence their luminosity. Using these values, he compared the redshift and was able to determine that these galaxies showed an excess redshift that was clearly non cosmological. Number eight, the physical movement of quasars. Now we've been observing quasars for long enough that it has become apparent that some have changed their shape, moves, or material has been ejected from them, which has moved. And in 1969, Leuton composed a list of quasars and their proper motion, i.e. their movement across the sky that we can see. This lateral motion of quasars, if we project it to the redshift distance, um, means that these objects must be moving at greater than the speed of light. Again, when analysing some of the jets emis emitted by these quasars and projecting that movement of the jet to uh, where they should be at their redshift distance means that these uh, ejected material it must be travelling at over seven times the speed of light. I hope this information has planted a seed of doubt around the idea that redshift is a true indicator of distance and also made you question what quasars really are and where they've come from. If redshift is not a good indicator of distance in our universe, then it has major implications for co cosmology and especially the Big Bang. This is one of the things we'll be focusing on in future videos. For now, follow the evidence, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.